verse 32, where he said to his followers, Don't be afraid, little flock, for your father is pleased to give you the kingdom. And when I think about that, I'd like a life that is way beyond fear and, and to not be afraid. And I'd like to live in the reality of the kingdom, of, of that kingdom of love and joy and peace. But if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to live in a life of love, joy and peace, if I'm going to change, and if I'm going to follow Jesus, I need help. I cannot do it on my own. I need a way of life that keeps me close to God and that keeps my mind aware of His presence through which I can receive the power to do what I cannot do on my own. I need a way of life that is not legalistic. I need a way of life that is not superficial or mechanical, but at the same time isn't just the same old way that everybody just does life in. Many times people think of that being a Christian is mostly about professing the right kind of beliefs. But it's not. One of the great illusions, even amongst church people, Christian people, is that information alone will produce transformation. And so you get a lot of Christians that love to go and sit and listen to sermons and go to Bible studies and all of these things and gather as much information as possible because they think that that information is going to lead to their transformation. Information is super important, I agree, but it's not sufficient. It's fascinating that in the early days of the church, the name that was given to the people in the Jesus community, in the church, was not the church, wasn't even really any other name you can think of, but it was the followers of the way. We see that in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and lots of other places. Followers of the way. They did not call them believers of the creed, now, a creed is really important. What you believe is really important. They were sometimes called believers. But in the New Testament, in the Greek language that the New Testament was written in, the word for belief and the word for trust is the identical same word. So anytime you see the word, you can translate it as the people who trust. To trust Jesus means precisely to follow in His way. The way they lived is actually described in Acts chapter 2. And in this series, we're going to take a look at that together. Over the next nine weeks, we're going to get to what you might think of as a discipleship pathway or a spiritual program, if you will or a framework. We're going to learn a way of life together as disciples, as students, as, uh, you know, students and apprentices of Jesus. We've been watching The Apprentice show that's come up. <laughs> but in a sense, we're apprentices of Jesus. It involves practices or steps taken directly from the New Testament. And it's informed by the 12 steps that you hear about, the AA 12 steps, because the 12 steps actually got borrowed from the church, and the church needs them back, and I'm taking them back today. We're calling the series Followers of the Way, right? And if you want to benefit from it, I'm going to ask that you make a commitment uh, to the whole series. So I know you're coming from Cornwall, but you're going to have to come here every single week for the next nine months. Every other week. Every, every other week, week yeah. <laughs> And I'm going to ask that if you want to benefit from it, to come just every weekend and live with these truths and these steps. They, they're so important. And if you go out of town, well, catch up on the series online. When you come every week, come with raw honesty and a deep, joyful sense of overpowering personal spiritual inadequacy. Okay? Some of you look way too put together right now. You look way too, you know, like you've got everything sorted. And I'm going to ask you to just work those problems this week and come back a little messier next week. That will help 
Hassan a lot. We are liars. We are gossips. We are cheats. We are failed parents. Yeah. We are cranks, the greedy, the needy, the anxious, the over-energetic, the proud. And we cannot afford to live in pretense and hiding. And so we cannot afford that. Which is why we say everybody's welcome and nobody's perfect. Let's not pretend that we are. This is a place where you can be you. Okay? And I'll tell you really frankly what will make the series used by God in your life is not mainly what you're hearing during the sermons. I'm going to try to make them as clear and helpful and spiritually practical as I can. But what will impact you is what, you, what happens in between the sermons together with God. Yeah. And it always has been that way in the Bible for, for the followers of the way. Right? I would encourage you to make sure that you're in a connect group. If you're not in a connect group, we meet on Wednesdays. Uh, every alternate Wednesday, is it next? Yeah. Every alternate Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, for those <coughs> who are interested, we're having a curry night. So if you would like curry, uh, the content won't be as spiritual, but it would be pretty <laughs> spicy. So come and join us for that. If you want details, come see Nikki or I afterwards. I mean, we're trying to really lure you back into Brighton Home, <laughs> leave Cornwall. So come and, and uh, come and have a chat with us. Uh, and, but other than a connect group, I want you to pick another person and talk with them about how it's going on, how it's going on the way for you. What are, what are you learning? What are you, what, where are you getting messed up? What, where are your struggles? Where are you finding God? And ask them to pray for you. And ask them to pray for you and for you to pray for them. Yeah. Learn about it together. Right? We're not really, really going to get benefit from this if we're not doing this together with somebody else. If you need a jacket, I have my jacket you can borrow. I'm getting very cold. It's a lot colder where I am. I'm waving my hands and I can feel the cold. The goal of the series is not that we just finished and everybody's done with it. We're going to get into these steps, these practices that are grounded in the Word of God in the Bible, that have been used and they've been tested and they've, uh, in a coherent way to help us live very close to God and to receive the power from God as long as we're living, because we need the power of God to help us. And so the idea is that we're never actually really done with this. We're going to be learning spiritual steps arranged around three words. Up, in, and then out. So say that with me. Up, up in, in, and then out. out. Okay, we're going to do three ups, three ins, and three outs because we use that structure here. So today's step is the foundation. Uh, and uh, it's the ground for everything else that we're going to learn. It's the grounding for everything else that we're going to learn, right? And if you don't get this one, everything else will kind of get messed up because it then becomes stuff. It be then becomes another self-help kind of program, and we don't want that. So, you can summarize step number one in two words. Give up. Surrender. Surrender your life and your will fully to God. This is expressed in the most famous prayer of all time, and it's called the Lord's Prayer. And in a single verse where Jesus says, Your will be done. We're all going to carry that prayer with us today and into this week. And so let's say those four words together out aloud. Your, your will, will be done. The amazing thing about this prayer is that you can pray it at any time. Any time of the day, any time of the week, whatever the challenge, Lord, your will be done. And when you're frustrated because you're in a traffic jam, because you cannot control the traffic, when you're worried about your kids, because you cannot control them, when you're mad at your spouse, because you cannot control them, when you're mad because you don't have a spouse, because you're not in control of that, when your computer crashes at work, when you don't get accepted into the school that you so desperately wanted to get into,
when you do not get the job or the promotion that you were so desperate for, when you're hoping that she would say yes, but she said no, when you're worried about, you know, that she would say yes, and you ask her, and she says yes, but then you decided you actually were hoping she would say no. When you're worried about money, when you're laying down and you're feeling stressed, you can say this prayer, your will be done. Something in the universe, guys, gets unlocked when you surrender your will over to God. It's like a key to a door. Somebody wrote, that it's the key that opens almost all by itself, and inside we see a pathway with an inscription that says, this is the way to a faith that works. And it does work. And I'll tell you what's so amazing about this prayer and why I need it so much. I've been a Christian a long time. And I'm spiritually mature enough now that I personally only have two problems. Right? Some of you have lots of them. But I only have two problems. Okay? One of them is that I do things that I don't want to do. And the other one is I don't do the things that I really want to do. Does anybody else have either of those problems? Right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I say, don't eat that, and then I eat it. Don't drink that, then I drink it. Don't smoke that, then you smoke it. Don't look at that sight. Don't whip out. Don't procrastinate. Don't brag. Don't envy. <laughs> Don't yell at the kids. Don't say, you look just like your mother. <laughs> Then those words come out of my mouth. <laughs> Got myself into trouble with that one. Paul said, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. <clears throat> for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. But guys, this is the human condition. We want to do what is good, but, and, but the reality is we are prepared to do what is wrong if we feel like we have to do it to get what we want. Most people think the response to this, even if you became a Christian, is to try a little harder. Just try a little harder. Try harder to be like Jesus. Try harder to obey God. Try harder to become a better person. But any addict will tell you and whether or not you have identified addiction to some substance or some behavior, every one of us has a heart that is a little idle factory. And what we call addictions in the biblical times were generally called idolatries. Every one of us is attached to the wrong stuff. Any addict will tell you that trying a little harder just doing a little more, putting a little more effort into it, ain't going to get the job done, guys. It's just not going to get the job done. And by the way, if you're just exploring faith, this is why surrender is important to you, even if you do not believe in God yet. Here's the reality. There is my will. In other words, what I want, you know, getting my way. And then there is doing the right thing. What is good, what is noble, what is courageous, what is truthful. How many of you have ever found that at least once in your life, and maybe a little more, getting your way is not the same as doing the right thing? Do they? Even if you don't believe in God, to live with an unsurrendered will is to cut against the grain universe. Good exists even if I don't want it, whether or not you believe in God. Reality, including spiritual reality, exists even if I don't like it. It's as though goodness and spiritual reality are like a mighty river. And when I surrender my will, and when I say I no longer always just try to get my way, but I seek to do what is good, what is honorable, what is true, it's like I'm suddenly moving with a current that is far greater than myself. No one has ever lived, modeled, 
taught or identified with greater clarity than this man called Jesus. He expressed over and over and just these, these unforgettable words. He says, whoever wants to become my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And you can discover this if you run a little experiment. Right? Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. There's a lot of confusion about what it means to take up your cross and deny yourself. But it simply means to say, my desires and what I want are no longer my ultimate goal. I'm willing to give up what I want in order to do what is good. That's what it means to take up your cross and deny yourself. My life is no longer primarily about getting my own way. The first step is the foundation for everything else. It's not to exert my will and to try harder, but it is to surrender my will. It's fascinating. You may know about the AA. Anybody here about the AA? Right? I think the AA meet here. Yeah, twice a week. Midweek, twice, twice a week. The AA got the 12 steps from the discipleship movement called the Oxford Group. More than a century ago, it was around. And the first three steps are this, okay? We admit, I think I may have, but this is it. We admit we were powerless over our problems, that our lives had become unimaginable, and we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, and we let it. That's what's in the 12 step. steps. Step number three says this, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. These are sometimes summarized in three great phases. Type them out there. I can't, God can. I think I'll let it. Let's say those three uh, things together out aloud. Write those. I can't, God can. I think I'll let him. That's the foundation right there. I cannot do that. I cannot do what? I cannot fix myself. I cannot fix you. I cannot remove my guilt. I cannot help that I'm an alcoholic, or a rageaholic, or a workaholic, or a greedaholic, or an, an imageaholic, or a judgmentaholic. I cannot give myself a personality transplant. I cannot be the man or the husband or the friend or the father or the person or a pastor I know I'm called to be. I cannot control my worry or my eating or whatever else it is. I cannot. God can. I think I'll let him. Have you ever prayed this prayer? Have you ever taken this step? Honestly? A lot of people in our day are afraid of surrendering their wills to God. Yeah. They think that surrendering your will to God means mindless obedience or robotic conformity. But it doesn't. It does not. Not at all. Your will, your will, it's precious to God. It's a precious thing to God. God does not want robotic conformity or drones or clones. God wants persons. Kingdom life is a personal life. God wants persons with joyful, creatively, uh, who, who, with joyfully, creatively, intelligently surrendered wills because God is God and I'm not God. Aren't you glad about that? And because it's precisely my selfish, unsurrendered, self centered, self promoting will that actually is my main problem. Here's how the big book of the AA describes the problem. It says, each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show, is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, the rest of the players in his own way. 
If his arrangements would only stay put, if only people will do as he wished, the show would be great. That's the way it seems to me. I want my own little world where everybody does my will and where my will is done. But of course, this puts me on a collision course with everybody else's will in the world. Because they all have their own will. The bad news is, I cannot. I can't. The good news is, God can. And the question is, question is, have you let him? Have you let him? This is the foundation. And I'll tell you one amazing, you know, one God can moment. But a hundred years ago, a wealthy, gifted young businessman named Roland was secretly a hopeless alcoholic. He was locked up countless times. He had enough money to cover it up, but he knew that he was headed for insanity or death. So desperate that he ended up going to Europe for about a year under the care of the great famous Swiss psychiatrist named Carl Jung. I think the G is silent. He left Jung sober and convinced that he's now so self-aware and that he had his problem with alcohol sorted. But guess what? He got drunk before he reached the boat to go back home. He went back to Jung and I think, you know, and he says, you know, I need you to think about this, but he said to, to Carl, Oh, Carl said to him, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I've never seen one single case recover if it's as bad as you. Roland said it was like the gates of hell clang shut on him. And then he said this. He says, is there no exception? This is what Carl Jung said to him. Yes. One. Here and there, alcoholics have what are called vital spiritual experiences. They find God. Hope for you will be found there if you will be found, at, if it will be found at all, said Carl Jung. Roland, he found God and had a vital spiritual experience in a little fellowship, in a little church of disciples, followers of Jesus called the Oxford Group, who were devoted to these steps and that eventually led to a man who became known as Bill W, and then Dr. Bob, and then something called the AA. I can't. God can. God can give an alcoholic power to be sober. And not just that. God can give a greedy tax collector named Zacchaeus the power to become the example of generosity. God can give a frightened failure by the name of Simon to be the power to become a courageous leader named Peter. God changed the hater of Peter, a guy by the name of Saul, into a lover of people and got a new name called Paul. And Paul says this, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. We think of surrender as a weak act for weak people. But the great discovery of the spiritual realm seen by Jesus, seen by Paul, seen by countless people through the centuries and rediscovered by the AA is that surrender is the pathway of power to power. And I felt that in my own life, in times when I wanted to snap in anger or withhold in, in, in apathy or withdraw and practice my spiritual gift of pouting, I think he knows about that spiritual gift, I'm sure. A little voice says, no, not that way. Not your will, John. I can't, but God can. I think I will tell And of course, our egos will give us lots of reasons why we shouldn't do this. I might miss out on what I really want. You know, the money, uh, the pleasure, the reputation, or whatever else I have to have. If I did that, if I'd surrender to God, God would probably make me out to be some monk out there, or a nun, or a missionary, or a pastor, or something really awful like that, right? I'd be unable to think for myself anymore if I surrendered. I would live in a chronic deprivation of the stuff that I really want if I'm going to have any gratification in my life. I'd become a doormat if I surrendered. 
I become weak and dependent, you know, a, a dependent personality. But here's the spiritual truth. It actually works the, the other way around. If I'm dependent on God, then I'm no longer dependent on money for my security yeah. or anything else. I'm not dependent on my attractiveness for my worth, and I know that there's a lot of that. I'm not dependent, that was a joke by the way. I'm not dependent on my circumstances for my peace. I'm not dependent on my children's lives for my well-being. Yeah. Okay, can I get an amen for that? Amen. I'm not dependent on your approval for my confidence. The more I depend on God, the more independent I actually become in real life. And let's take it a little deeper. In Luke's version, Jesus adds a very little helpful word to this idea of surrender. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up the cross daily and follow me. People wonder sometimes, is surrender a once for all kind of thing? Well, there has to be a once. You don't just drift into it, but then it's all of the time. It's every day. Here's why. Here's the thing about my will. I turn it over to God, and then I take it back. That's what we do. I turn over my will to God, and then I take it back. I turn it over, here you are, God, and then I take it back. I think I'm surrendered. Sometimes I'm at home enjoying talks with God, and it's very spiritual. I'm at home practicing the prayer of surrender. God, have it all, my money, my energy, my family, my will, my relationships, and my time, and I surrender it all. Your will be done, and it's very spiritual. And I'm actually quite moved by how devout my surrender is. And then Nikki says, John, will you please clean the kitchen like you said you would do? No, stop interrupting me. I'm having a spiritual moment here, Nix. I've surrendered everything to Jesus, and you're getting in the way. God, I said, your will be done, but not her will be done. I think I've surrendered my time until somebody wants it. I think I've surrendered my money until somebody needs it. I think I've surrendered my circumstances until they don't suit me. I think I've surrendered my will until it gets crossed. I'm never done learning this prayer. But the beauty of this prayer, and part of why it's the foundation, is that you can pray all day long and it will never cease to energize you. It will never cease to fill you up again. It's kind of like breathing. Living with a freshly surrendered will is the foundation. And the book of the AA puts it like this. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent upon the maintenance of our spiritual condition. This is just profound truth about the nature of discipleship and following Jesus. That's why if I'm doing it rightly with this as the first step, it could never lead to that older, elder brother pride judgment looking down yeah. at others. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into our daily activities. How can I best serve you, God? Your will, not mine, be done. See, these are the thoughts which must go on with us constantly, every day. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is, this is the proper use of our will. This is extraordinary wisdom. Dallas Willard, a writer and a speaker, says this. He says, our wills are made to surrender to God. That's simply true. One of the classic stories of the big book is, uh, the big book of the AA is an alcoholic doctor who was not surrendered for so long and he was convinced that his difficulties, all the problems that he had were due to everybody else and everything except for him. And he writes this, he says, he writes, you, you drink too if you had my problems, you would drink a lot. You would drink too if you had my marriage. He writes, it's not that I didn't care enough about my wife, I care too much. 
I sent her to four consecutive psychiatrists and not one of them got me sober. I also sent my kids to psychiatrists. I remember even the dog had a psychiatric diagnosis. I yelled at my wife, what do you mean the dog just needs more love? And he goes on to say, you tell that silly doctor he's not a Beverly Hills psychiatrist. All I want to know is why does that dog wet in my lap every time I hold it? And in brackets he says, the dog hasn't wet my pants once since I joined the AA, and neither have I. <laughs> and then he writes about finally accepting his powerlessness and this amazing discovery. And this is what he says. He says, an acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I'm when I'm disturbed, it's because I find some person, some place, something, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, that place, that thing or situation as being exactly the way it's supposed to be at this moment. I need, needed to concentrate not on what needs to be changed in the world, as much as what needs to be changed in me. Acceptance is the answer of all my problems today. I can't. God can. And I think I let him. Your will be done. So, welcome to the way. Okay? It all begins with surrender of our lives and our wills as we turn them over to God. That's the foundation. Now, this week, if surrender is hard for you, and it will be, and if, it, if, you, if your will pushes back, and it will push, I want you to know that you're not alone. Yeah. You don't have to do this on your own. I, want, I was thinking this week, getting ready for this message, through all eternity, the Son has willed what the Father willed. He's always wanted to do the will of the Father, Jesus. You read scripture and you know he says I only do what the father tells me to do throughout this whole earthly life Jesus delighted to do the will of the father his great prayer was I think it's here your will be done on earth as it is in heaven he loved his father's will so much that he said to his disciples he said my food is to do the will of him who sent me almost like it feeds him to do the will of the father feeds him nourishes him but in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's facing not just death, not just death on the cross, but what we call on the cross, what he would call God forsakenness. That's what he's about to experience, God abandonment. The weight somehow of that alienation and the death and the sin and the hell of every hu human broken soul, it's crushing him in the Garden of Gethsemane to such a degree that in the Garden he tells his father, that he does not want that. He goes on to say, if you are willing, take this cup from me. This is Jesus. He knows the will of the Father. But he's saying, if you're willing, please take this cup from me. It's too heavy to bear. Maybe part of the pain of Gethsemane was for the first time in all eternity, the Son now has, this, has to struggle with not wanting to do the will of the Father. The son realizes this is what it is to not want what my father wants and to desire what is opposed to my father's will. All of us know this. This is the fracture in our souls to know what is good and to know what is God's will for my life and to not want it. And then to have to choose God's will or my will. This is like the drama of every human life in him. It's like all of heaven is holding their breath at this moment and then Jesus makes his choice and what is his choice he says yet not my will but yours be done yeah then the next line much less famous says such wonderful things about the life in his kingdom and then it says there then an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him Jesus surrenders his will to his father and an angel comes down and strengthens him. By the way, I believe that that angel is still on duty and he does house calls. Yeah. Right? 
I want to give you a chance to surrender your will to them. Maybe you've never deliberately turned your will and your life over to God. And so this can be your vital spiritual experience this morning. Here and there, Jesus comes. And it's kind of like this. In a wedding, there, there are lots of peripheral details. You all know that. There are flowers and music. And there are guests and there are special clothes. And there are decorations. There are fan there's fancy food, etc., etc. But what makes a wedding are three simple things. A promise, a vow, a commitment. Right? You could say they're one thing, really. Not all of these peripheral things. That, those things don't really make a wedding. What makes a wedding is a promise to this other person. A vow, a commitment. Nix and I stood on a platform a long time ago, and the pastor asked her, do you take this man? She didn't pause. It was, there was no long pause, right? And then she says, yes, I take him. I take him. And then he asked me, do you take this woman? And here's the question for you today. Do you take this man, Jesus, to be your forgiver, to be your friend, to be your shepherd, to be your guide, your leader, your Lord? If not, who else? I want to invite you as we start this journey together to make this decision. Won't you bow your heads and close your eyes just for a few moments? And this